Hey everybody, Dr. Dan here. This is about chapter 19. So sort of the big event in chapter 19 is World War I, sort of the first big global scale industrial wars. So that's the, the big takeaway here. But I, the, the book really premises this about uh, visions of the modern and really talks about these different visions for uh, governments and government structure. And, and World War I ties into this because I think it really marks a change between old and new. So modern is somewhat of an appropriate word for this chapter because start, things start to change after World War I uh, significantly. So, um, you know, I, I really don't care about dates that much, but it's important that you know that World War I occurs between 1914 and 1917. Uh, the United States gets into the war really late, so that's that's one part of it. Um, and and really, one of the best passages about the chapter is uh, or about the war is really on page seven oh nine. It, it's called the Great War, and and asks you how the Great War changes the world. And so it's complicated, but the war starts because there is a void in the Balkan region, which is north of Turkey, north of the Ottoman Empire, uh, near Ukraine. And uh, you can look at the map and, and see where all these things are at. There's a good map on 712 and 713, so I encourage you to look at it so you kind of get a feel for where this is all taking place. Um, the book talks about these three visions for modernism, and, and maybe a better term is three visions for government or government systems. So liberal democracy is certainly what we run under today. Uh, authoritarianism is a, probably a, a decent example is China. There are many more, but uh, that's you know a strong, a strong government, a strong authority. And then the third type is anti-colonialism. So that's really something that is specific to this era of time back in the early 1900s and not so much today. So uh, understand what those three visions are as far as structure and, and the way a society and a government should be set up. Um, you know, as far as the war is concerned, it's complicated, but suffice it to say that, that um, the German Empire, uh, Austria-Hungary, is starting to stretch its wings, if you will, and, and become more powerful. And, and because there's a void in the Balkan region, there's really a land grab by several countries. And there's this question of, you know, who's going to get this territory? Is it going to be the Russians? Is it going to be the Germans? Um, and, and so that's one of the big causes of the war. There are two sides. So there's the uh, uh, Allied powers, uh, there's the Axis powers, and you know I don't really know that it's important you remember who's on each one of these sides, but but know that um, uh, the British, the French, uh, the Russians, and us, the U.S., although late, are uh, the allies, and they're basically fighting uh, the Germans. So that's sort of the that's sort of the big crux of it. It's a lot more complicated, but you know, as long as we know who's who, um, I think I think we're okay. And I think you'll pick up on this stuff as you read the chapter. And um, the war is brutal. And I, I put a little um, uh, clip in there, actually from a to a Downton Abbey scene. If any of you watch Downton Abbey, and there's about one minute at the end of this clip that shows you trench warfare. So when I talk about industrial warfare, I'm talking about you know, um, submachine guns, uh, poison gas, new types of bombs, even tanks are introduced at this time. So what it means is that a lot of people are going to die. So in the Battle of the Somme, uh, one of the most devastating battles in World War I, the Brits lose like 57,000 soldiers in one day on one battlefield. So you can kind of get a feel. It's, it's very similar to the Civil War in the U.S. that uh, the killing is just devastating. The numbers are are unbelievable. So uh, read through so you learn about World War One, and then also understand the global nature of the con of the conflict because that's a, the first thing. Uh, pages seven twelve uh, through seven thirteen. Again, look at that map. Uh, also understand because of World War One. Uh, after it ends, there's a lots, lots of other things going on. So the Russian Revolution in 1917, where the Tsar is murdered and the Bolsheviks take over. So that's really the start of 
of uh, communism, maybe Leninism is a better word in this case, but it's a it's the start of the command and control non-capitalist economy uh, that would become the Soviet Union, that is Russia today, and also uh, I think it's, inter- it's interesting on page 715, uh, the book's going to talk about the League of Nations, which is sort of this precursor to the United Nations. Uh, I think it's important that you know about that. It, it tells us that uh, liberal democracy, or at least um, liberal govern- governance, um, often tries to respond to war and conflict by putting together structures and frameworks um, that are in place to try to prevent further wars. And certainly the League of Nations uh, is the first attempt at doing that, although ultimately it fails. The other thing that this chapter uh, talks about a lot is the Great Depression, and the Great Depression, of course, happens after World War I, but the Great Depression, uh, that's what we call it in the U.S., but there was really a financial panic uh, globally, all around the world, and a lot of that having had to do with the great war debt left behind after World War I. Um, one of the important things, I think, is that the Germans, at the end of World War I, and the Germans lose, um, are forced to pay reparations to uh, other countries, and the penalty for the Germans, the financial penalty penalty for the Germans, is a, is a, is a problem, and it's going to come back to create a situation in Germany where the people, you know, the the citizens, you and me, are unhappy and very vulnerable about the way they're living, and I think. When people are not living well, when they can't find jobs, when money's bad, uh, they are um, uh, susceptible to powerful people who make a lot of promises. And certainly Adolf Hitler is going to come along and make a lot of promises uh, to the German people and talk about the superiority of the German people and uh, basically also talk about how the Germans got ripped off by reparations in World War I. And that's going to set the stage for a very unified uh, Nazi movement that is going to get us into World War II in subsequent chapters. So I think it's important that you read about authoritarianism as it applies to fascism, which is Mussolini and uh, certainly Hitler. This idea that a strong leader can make a lot of promises to the people when the people People are vulnerable and a movement can, can occur. And I think it's important for us to understand that even in our own country uh, because we are always wary of very strong, charismatic leaders who you know, want to shut down the press or, or want to censor or send out messages uh, that are mediated on their own terms. So pay attention to that. I don't know that the Twitter messages from the president get us there, but certainly this idea that uh, a leader comes along and, and promises a good economy and promises jobs. That's what politicians do. But but if we get a politician in office that says, hey, the media is bad and I want to control the message and I'm going to control you know what we make in this country and I'm going to be nationalist and I'm going to control uh, the economy in the country without the help of the people, then you have a problem. Then you're looking fascism right right in the face. So understand what the definition of fascism is. Uh, I put it in my reading notes so you can read through it. I want you to know that. And I guess sort of the big thing I want you to know is, is that when populations are down and out, when we are vulnerable because of war or because of economic hardship, we are more willing to accept strong leadership that makes us a lot of promises and we have to be careful with that because um, you know factions rise up and they can they can take over the country and that's certainly not what the basis of our democracy is built on and I'm not making a political statement here it's just really the lesson that comes out of chapter 19 that when countries are down and out uh, things change. So as you go through the chapter, you're going to read about the rise of Nazism. You're going to read about the Russian Revolution. You are going to read about the Japanese Empire and how Japan starts to sort of flex its wings and grab power in China. It starts a uh, sort of a puppet colony there uh, in Manchuria called Manchuko. And uh, you should read about that because you're seeing after World War I various countries trying to become more powerful, perhaps more imperialistic, and uh, that's going to cause some problems down the road. Also, 
Um, you're going to read about the Great Depression, which is pretty cool. And I want you to read about mass production and consumption, pages 718 and 719. I have some ideas about mass production and how it has affected society. Uh, one of them, I think, with mass production, you know, we lost our we lost our skills. We lost our ability to be craftsmen. Uh, the quality of building stuff or baking stuff, whether it's a loaf of bread or an automobile, uh, everything became uniform. And I think, in some way, it's a shame that that we lost the idea of craftsmanship. Uh, but in another way, mass production and uniform production, not uniforms like what you wear, but things where everything is the same, um, I think that um, bonds society close together because all of us have the same things. We all, uh, we all drive the same cars, that sort of thing. So I think that there's good parts and bad parts of mass production, but I want you to read about it because it's really a direct result uh, from World War I, and we really never looked back as far as uh, mass consumption either. So, so read about that stuff. Um, this chapter is cool because we're getting into the modern. So it talks about uh, work projects administration under the New Deal. If you're ever on campus at the University of Toledo, the field house, the glass bowl, uh, those, are, those were built by WPA workers uh, during, during the Great Depression. So it's pretty cool because you can relate to it. So anyway, that's that. Uh, read through the chapter, and I will talk to you again next week. Have a great day. Take care now. Bye-bye.